Clear prop. Tower 7 3 is Cherokee, number 2, following twin traffic, 3 mile final. There's nothing to do. One trial at Bravo, makes for in runway 25, going uh, 4 mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now, let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm fantastic. This week, we're taking on a topic that I've thought a lot about, and I know we've talked about it more than once, but we are going to talk about why you, as a student of whatever you're at in your aviation career, should seek out marginal weather days with a flight instructor. Absolutely. I think uh, I, I I worked on my instrument now. It's been almost three years ago. Um, speaking of, three years ago yesterday was my three-year anniversary of buying this place. All right. Um, well, congratulations. Thanks. thanks. So about three years ago, I had finished my instrument rating or so, but uh, while I was in training, the instructor that I had was really adamant that we get some actual time. And I've spoken about it. I was really an apprehensive pilot, uh, young in my aviation career. I didn't feel real comfortable with everything, and I, that just kind of scared me. But I think the fact that he was so adamant that we do it and that we got it while I was training for my instrument was some of the most invaluable time I ever got. I believe when I took my check ride with you, I had something like eight hours of actual time, which to someone listening who's not there yet might think that that's like nothing. But how many hours do you have to have, Wally, to take your check ride in actual conditions? Zero. Wow. Wow zero actual time to uh, qualify for an instrument rating. You got to have 40 hours of instrument time, um, all of which can be uh, simulated under the hood, wearing a foggles or whatever view limiting device uh, you choose. And some of it can be in a simulator. Um, it's, you know, I, I use the little analogy of, and this is not really totally accurate, but, um, you know, if, if you wanted uh, to someone to play football, you wouldn't teach them how to play basketball and say, here's the ball, go play football. Um, you know, you'd, you'd actually show them how to play football. A better one there might be, you don't do all your learning playing flag football and then go play Division One tackle football. That's that's probably a better way of putting it. That's probably, probably a much better way of putting it. Um, there are, I, I, you know, of, of the instrument check rides I've given um, – I don't know, well, well over 100 instrument check rides over the last several years. Um, I'd say 30% of my check rides are instrument check rides. So if I do the math, that's um, uh, about 170 uh, instrument check rides. I would guess that um, out of that, of those people, and this is a very informal poll, but I would say 50% of those people have zero actual time. God. Crazy. Um, I would say um, with my private pilot candidates, I would say 95% of them have zero actual time. And, and that's a different deal. It's a different situation. Uh, a private pilot, non-instrument rated private pilot, if they're doing their due diligence, they're not going to get in a situation where they're they're in actual, but it could happen. I mean, we, we are required to get three hours of instrument time. We are required to evaluate it on a private pilot check ride. Um, it's all done under the hood or, or using a view limiting device. Um, but, but to that point, do you, would you would you think that getting an hour of actual would be good for a private candidate? Oh my gosh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because you know why? You know I, I tell private pilot candidates that if they are in actual, it's an emergency. No it question. is an emergency situation, and they need to tell ATC about it, um, that they're not instrument rated, and, and this is the situation that they're in. Um, you, need, you need to let, let people know it, it's an emergency situation. That's one reason why, you know, we, we concentrate on standard rate turns. We're doing everything slower in, in instrument conditions, especially for someone of li limited experience. So uh, for a private pilot candidate to get uh, a little bit of actual time, even, you know, just um, half an hour, five tenths, um, I, I, I believe is invaluable. No doubt. And, and it's doable. I think what we 
collectively probably haven't done a good job of as a as an industry or as a as a career possibility is to to drive that home. We 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 focus on these rules that we have to accomplish and we we do those things. Let's take it to the next level. Seek out that marginal weather even as a private student and get get a little bit of time because it will change your mind. I think I asked people that have worn foggles and had actual, how different is it? Most will say it's not even the same thing. The foggles and the view limiting devices don't really do justice to what actual time is really like. Right. When you get in the clouds, and I remember my first time we were taking off 17 right. Uh, it was about a thousand foot day. We were turning right to go towards um, Coulter Field was where we were going. And so that's probably about a hundred to 190 degree turn, maybe well, not even that it's about a hundred degree turn. It's, it's a pretty big turn. And we, we were in our turn and we got in those clouds and I just remember that the instruments looked backwards. You know, the, the artificial horizon looked like it was pointing the other direction. I don't know why my eyes just sort of flipped on me that day, but I, I remember really being disoriented and I think it's because you're, well, I know it's because your eyes and your brain can no longer work together. Even when you have foggles on, you see a little bit of ground sweeping by in the windows, your brain's able to calculate what's going on. But when that all turns the same shade of gray, there's nothing your brain can do to yeah. fix what's really happening yeah. in your inner ear. And you just instantly start feeling weird. Right. Right. And, and we, you know, there are, there's countless number of accidents where we can talk about, um, where, where this was an issue. I mean, probably the most famous was John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, uh, crashing into the water. Um, I don't know. That, that was around 2000, a long time ago. Yeah. Something like that. Um, I, it's my next episode on air disasters, by the way, it, it started, I, whatever I finished, it started showing the previews of him in a Saratoga. Right. Uh, that went right. down. And it'll be a good watch for sure. Right. But it happens instantaneously for people. Um, I think once they assume he went into IMC, it's like three minutes, two minutes, and he was at 6,000 feet. Yeah. So you're talking two or three minutes later. Yeah. I've always heard the uh, phrase that if you're not an instrument rated pilot and you fly into IMC, you're probably going to hit the ground or get out of IMC within 90 seconds. If it, if it's not within 90 seconds, it's too long. You will be disoriented and you just can't overcome it. Um, yeah. I think every, you know, the, the killing zone talks about a lot. Most of these people are pulling up when they're pointing straight down at the ground, right? They're just making it worse and worse and worse. Right. Right. So it happened this week at this flight school, um, students and instrument, Instructors got together and they flew an IMC intentionally for this reason. Um, even on some days off, people came in. This week we had about a 1,700-foot ceiling at the best part of the day, and it was probably about uh, 900 or 1,000 the rest of the day. So it's it's a marginal VFR day for part of the day. It's a IFR day for part of the day. Calm winds on a day like that, or it probably blow some of that junk out of here, right? Right really good days to fly for practice if you're if you if you're a private or instrument student yeah. or even a commercial student or maybe an instrument rated student that hasn't flown in the soup in 9 months I yeah. mean you might have shot some approaches on a sim or shot them under the hood i still think it makes sense for those rated and proficient current pilots to go out and get some actual time i don't think it's a stretch to say that uh, what a lot of what happens with a lot of people is they get their instrument rating, and then tomorrow they come back and they start working on their commercial, um, and you know the commercial maneuvers. On, you know on the commercial check ride, there's no instrument um, work uh, or, or nothing is evaluated from an instrument standpoint. So um, you know the the commercial check ride is a strictly a VMC check ride. So I think people forget about that. Well, then, then what happens? You get your commercial and then they start working on their, their CFI. Lo and behold, now we got a CFI, maybe even a CF double I, um, who is now going to teach people instruments and they have extremely, uh, low, um, experience flying in the clouds. As I'm sitting here thinking about it, 
I'm wondering, and I will pull all my CFIs to find how much actually they have because if they don't have it, they need to go get it together and yeah. fly together. Yeah. Because I don't want my team to be teaching future candidates without the real experience. I mean, it makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. Do you think? Do you have, do you think there's CFIs out there that have no time that are that are training that are going to get in the plane and train in actual? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. Um, and some of it can be geographically uh, related. I mean, uh, people who are maybe out in Arizona, uh, maybe, maybe it's tough to find a bad weather day. It's true. Um, but, um, I, I happen to be sitting at a flight school it was not this flight school, but it, I was sitting at a flight school not probably a year ago. And I heard one of their, the CFIs, I overheard them, the, the CFI talking and the CFI was a little bit concerned because they said that they were about to have their first instrument student and that they only had two tenths of an hour in their entire logbook of actual instrument time. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. Twelve minutes. That of could have been ten, time. but we'll yeah. give them the benefit of the doubt. Exactly. Say exactly. I mean, think about it. Think about it. What is there in life that you're proficient and competent at that you've only done for 12 minutes? Nothing. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah, that's a shame. And and I think I know, here's what I know. When I was a private student and I don't think I was, when I was about to take that check right, I don't think I was ever thinking about that I was going to go right into my instrument and I didn't go right into it, but I don't think I even thought I was going to earn or try to earn an instrument rating. And I can think back to those days and thought, there's no way I'm going to get into low visibility or clouds. Like there, there's just no way. So I don't need to practice this because my, my personal minimums are X and Y and I don't have anything to worry about. Right. And I, I'm assuming a lot of private pilots probably feel that way. But all these accidents happen because it happens when people said it would never happen and it happens, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I can. And I'll bet you JFK thought that, too. Uh, I'll bet he had that same mindset. Um, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, the things that I read, Sam, it sounds like he, he was a conscientious pilot. Um, I happened to be flying the day after that. I, I believe that accident happened on a Friday night. Um, I was flying into Norfolk, Virginia on the next Saturday, and we were being vectored um, for an instrument approach. Um, it, it was VMC conditions, but we were being vectored out over the water. And I just remember talking to my first officer and saying, my gosh, look look at this. I mean, you could see absolutely nothing. There was no horizon. The water blended in with the sky. It was just kind of, and I, I don't even want to say it was gray. It was almost a brown that particular day. And uh, we, we were discussing that, and we went in and landed. And when we landed, we, we turned on our cell phones, and, and we got uh, updates that, that uh, he had died the night before. And we were just thinking, wow, wow. We, I, I could see that happening. It, it, it will sneak up on you, could sneak up on you. I had an experience uh, as an instrument student flying on a VFR day where, and I don't think, so all students recognize this. We have a, a rule around here where a private student can't take off in a temperature dew point spread of four degrees, which is close enough to, to where moisture can get in the air and it cause a, a less than ideal visible day, right? So, but if you fly on a three or a two day where it's two or three degrees of the temperature dew point spread, when you get to about 500 feet and you look off into the distance, you can't see much. Right. I mean, yes, visibility is 10 miles, but when you look, when you're looking 50 miles in front of you and that's all the you, all that moisture in the air on that long distance kind of blocks your view. It's a very different way of flying. Yeah. And I got up above some of that and the temperature do I think the temperature dew point came together again on those days where you wake up, it's clear outside and then that fog just gets real dense where those, those two numbers end up matching. And it was below me that it was all foggy. And I would have had a real hard time landing if I was landing at that point. Yeah. And again, I was adamant. I'm never going to get in this situation. I'm never going to be in this situation. Right. Right. But I don't think we can control the weather on good days and we definitely can't control the weather on bad days. Yeah, I I think having the the mindset of well that that wouldn't happen to me. I one one thing I talk about on uh, briefings on check rides is we 
And we spend a lot of time talking about fuel and um, personal fuel minimums. And one thing that comes up is I talk about the number of fuel-related accidents that there are, and the, the numbers are, are staggering, uh, the number of airplanes that, that crash due to a lack of fuel. And and I, I'll, I'll ask the applicant, I'll say, how many of those people, what percentage of those people that had these fuel accidents do you think really woke up in the morning and said, hey, I think I'll go run an airplane out of fuel today? And, and of course, the answer is zero. No, nobody is thinking that. So uh, you gotta you got to be in the mindset of, yes, it can happen to me. You can get boxed to, into a corner. And, you know, because the visibility doesn't go from 10 miles to one mile, uh, you know, instantaneously. It happens slowly. It just slowly starts to deteriorate. And next thing you know, you're, you're in very reduced visibility. Well, that's a good question. Which, which to you, do you think a, a young pilot needs to be thinking more about? The ceiling or visibility? I would say the visibility. No doubt. Yeah. And I don't think we're taught that way, though. If you really you think about what we think about, we think about, okay, yes, visibility does come into play in IFR and VFR, but we're thinking ceiling almost yeah. all the time as a private yep. pilot because why? Yep. That lets us practice in the pattern or not practice in right. the pattern for, right. for more than not our most of our private career. Right. So we, we keep thinking 2,000, 2,500, 3,000. We think ceilings more often than not. But I would think on on my track now, if I'm going to go cross country, maybe like from here to New Orleans, I'm thinking visibility, lots of swampland, lots of water, lots of temperature change, could be on one side of a cold front and, or going to the other side of a cold front. Lots can happen. I think visibility is the one that we should be thinking about more. And that's what you should be looking at. A lot of airports could be reporting VFR, but it could be... You know, one city could be 10 miles, one could be nine miles, the next one could be eight miles. Right. All still VFR green dots on a map. Right. But something's telling me something there. Yeah. I need yeah. to use that information to my advantage. Yeah. Um, and then again, I think the, the one that caught me with, with my instrument training was rain. Uh, in Houston, we have a lot of these little pop-up cells and you you can take off in the middle of summer on a clear day, perfectly visible, no clouds in the sky, fly to Brenham, eat a hamburger, and then try to get back, and there'll be 12 pockets of three-mile circles of showers, right? Right. And mid, it can be misty showers. It doesn't right. have to be a lot, but there's so much humidity in the air in Houston that uh, that can that can congregate and then create a little bit of rain. Flying in the rain for the first time is very, very weird, too. And the visibility... Even to get through a short patch is is damn near zero. Yeah. yeah. So you better have your wits about yourself and know what what the instruments are saying if you ever happen to get into right. a little bit of drizzle. Uh, it can be just as bad as a really big cloud for sure. I, I do remember my first time to fly in terrain. I just remember the, the sound. I remember hearing it and thinking, well, what in the world is that? It, it sounded like the windshield was cracking. Yep. That was my first my first thought. So there's lots of reasons, but the ones that I'll point out, one, it's the experience. If you, if you don't have the actual, go get it, and you'll be shocked at how good you get. This isn't for the person that's never done it. It is, but it's not just for them. If you have 10 hours actual, but you don't have any in the last five years, go get some uh, on, on any case you can. I think a good 1,500-foot day with calmer winds is a really good day. You're not, you, you don't need to shoot to minimums on a, on a local or a ILS every time, you know, that's probably not in your wheelhouse yet, but I think I would build a plan to practice to that point. So yeah. maybe you fly with an instructor twice at 1500 feet and then you try to fly twice at a thousand feet and yep. then you, you get to where your confidence is up and you, you know what, you know what you're seeing and doing. And maybe you do have a day where you need to shoot to minimums, and you get that real practice in because, yeah. man, I can't imagine with my wife and a kid or two of my children in the plane with me being the first time I've ever shot a real ILS to minimums. Right. That's not going to feel any good. Yeah. The next reason I think you should really practice is we all use a lot of technology. It's probably really easy to use in a non-stress situation. For flight, 
other stratus tools. We look at weather a lot, but we're looking at weather miles from us. We're never we're never skirting the weather probably. Right. Um I need to know how to use that technology under a little bit of stress, right? Yeah. And that's what the practice should give you. Yeah. Um, what's my moving map look like with no visibility? I'm disoriented. I don't feel the way I felt on a VFR day. I'm looking down at my iPad a whole bunch. My inner ear's not going to be doing the same. Yeah. They're going to be doing a lot more gymnastics in there than they were on a VFR day where I get to look and look and look and reset. Right. Um, you need to have some confidence using that technology or whatever tools you're using, paper maps, whatever. You need to have that practice in of looking up and down in an, in an IMC condition for sure. What would be some of the reasons why you might, out of the norm, talk about why they should practice in IMC? Well, for, for all that you've said, um, you know, it's, it is, um, you know, the, the, when you put the hood on, it's simulated, it's simulated. So, uh, you, you, you hear athletes talk about, you can't, you know, you, you, I'm, I'm a big football fan, but you, you'll hear NFL players say you can't simulate game speed. No. Um, you can practice. And uh, you can do all that, but you can't simulate game speed. Um, so, you know, just using that terminology, you cannot simulate, um, um, you know, you can, we can try. And we do a, you know, fairly decent job of simulating um, IMC, but you, you just, it's just not the same. No. And then we've talked about this a few times in the past, but uh, wow, what about nighttime IMC, right? Yep. That that is a game changer uh, in the world of of what could be going on when you're in the clouds. Uh, yeah. Night is very different. The strobes, if you have the strobes on, I I, I did it once with my wife, and I, all I could think about was that Exorcist show where there was some devil out on the wing in a commercial in a commercial not ex the oh the Twilight Zone yeah, where yeah. the guy was on the wing, and. I turned the strobes off just so that would go away for her sake. Yep. Um, but it could be, it could be crazy if you've never been at night. So again, find time to practice, find a way to get in a plane with an instructor and do some, do some actual training at night as well. Yeah. It's, it's going to benefit you in case you ever go into it. Yeah. And, and start with flying under the hood at night. Just, just learn, learn where the, the, the switch is for the instrument lights. Um, you know, um, that kind of thing. Just so, so start simulated, start flying under the hood at night, maybe the first time, and then, then try to get that, that 1800, that 1500 foot broken or, or overcast evening where, um, you know, you can just see, see how the different external environmental, uh, things affect your, how you fly. Yeah. I think we talked about it a long time ago when Devin Miller was on the show. You know, how do you just stay proficient? And, and when we say proficient, we mean across the board proficient. I think I think we should all put in our, our logbook or our personal minimums some form of actual practice on a regular basis. I know a lot of people that probably shoot VFR approaches six times and track and do a hold. They do it every five months or so. And they might be current. And they might be legal but they're probably not proficient. I, I, I think we should all be at least trying to get some actual approaches in on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. The type of flying you do regular might mean different to you than it does yeah. for me. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that we have to put that in our toolkit in our fly bag and get some actual time. And the yeah. only way you're gonna do it is if you seek it out more than likely, yeah. you know, you're not, it's not going to randomly come across your, your, your next trip. You got to call a flight school. You got to see if you can get on the schedule and do it the same day. I mean, around here, a lot of people cancel. You know, they're not interested. Maybe they're just at the pre solo stage and it's not, it wouldn't be a good time for them to get the actual. Right. Or they don't want to get the actual. There's CFI sitting around here, aircraft sitting around here, and I bet all of them would go up. All of our CFIs have their double eye, all of them would go fly with you. Um, if you don't want to do it first in the aircraft, you have some concerns, jump in a full motion simulator, find a full motion simulator. If you get in that simulator with motion and you go all gray, you'll get some disorientation just like you will in an aircraft. Uh, and at least that's better than not. Right. For right. sure. Yeah. Do you like the, 
Is there a, is there a view limiting device you personally prefer? Not an endorsement by Wally Moorhern, but uh, is there something that like foggles are better than a shield or what, what would you prefer? I don't really have a preference. Um, you know, back when I learned, we wore these big things on our head uh, that we called a hood, and uh, it was it was funny. I was um, I was a fairly new CFI, and I was sitting at at the FBO that I worked for, the flight school I worked for, and um, we were having some const- construction done. We so we had a bunch of construction workers around. And I overheard one of the construction workers say to the other guy, he said, you see that thing over there? And, uh, and the other guy says, yeah. He says, um, he said that the, the, the instructors put that thing on the student's head so they can't see out the window. So that way it takes them longer to learn to fly and they make more money. <laughs> and I, I just, I, 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 thought, I thought he said it so that I could hear it. And um, I looked at him, and I expected him to start laughing or smiling, but he he didn't. So I I think he thinks he, I think that he thinks that's was accurate, but uh, obviously that's, that's not the reason we do that. Um, no, I mean I would say the vast majority of of my applicants have foggles, and uh, you know it's it's up to the applicant to bring their own, um, just uh, you know a view limiting device that that does the job. I wish someone would have told me I did my instrument training in the May, June, July time frame. Boy, some tinted foggles would have been nice in Houston because it felt like I was always flying directly into the sun. Yeah. And it just seemed to make the sun worse in, in, in smoked out foggles, right? Yeah. The other thing, we talked a little bit about technology. Um, the one that I skipped over that I'll, I'll go back to is, is autopilot. You know, you might know how to use autopilot when you're always flying VFR direct to, but this is a great opportunity to really hone your skills with approach mode, um, how to get to top of your top of climb numbers, how to get the sense down pat, because all that stuff, like you said, when we, when we're teaching how to fly in the clouds, we want small little movements. So we don't get disoriented or don't shake our heads too much and move around. So you want to descend at a pretty good descent rate, something that's consistent. And autopilots will always fly it better than we can fly it. And again, you may know how to use yours, but you might not know how to use it in the stress of being on an approach, getting vectors, turning into final, not being able to see the ground. It's probably going to be a different momentum. It's going to be a little quicker. Like you said, the game's going to move a whole lot faster and to be proficient with that autopilot is going to benefit you and your passengers greatly yeah. uh, if you have it at your disposal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And autopilot, especially in IMC conditions. Uh, flying flying IMC is uh, mentally draining. I think uh, most students who come back from a maybe an hour and a half instrument flight uh, would would say mentally they are, or well, physically too, but they are probably much more tired in general than, than a, a private pilot student who maybe went out and uh, did stalls and steep turns and came in and did uh, six or seven touch and goes. Um, I think without a doubt, the instrument student is going to be more drained. And that's, that's the beauty of the autopilot. It lets you mentally relax a little bit. Now, you're not, obviously, you're not totally relaxed. You're not just totally um, letting go of what the airplane is doing, you're monitoring everything. But at, at this point, you become uh, a manager as much as a pilot. You're managing the technology. No doubt. And technology hurts people too. So make sure you understand what you're seeing and you're still cross-scanning and doing all your scan stuff to make sure you don't have a bad instrument yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, and if the technology goes crazy, get rid of the technology and fly the airplane. No doubt. Always fly the airplane first. Well, hopefully this helps. Hopefully you'll seek out the opportunity to go do some real actual flying in marginal weather with a flight instructor at a local school near you. Um, we, I told Wally this before we start recording, I think we're going to test the waters and try and make some social media posts about great days that are marginal weather for students to come join us and fly. So if you're in the local Houston area market and you follow us on social media, look for some of those posts coming on marginal days. And if you're interested, come jump in a plane with one of our instructors and uh, get some flight time with it. Anything to add, Wally? No. Well, 
We always want your show ideas, and we just got our first batch of T-shirts. I will post some pictures of those T-shirts in the next few hours. But if you are interested in a T-shirt, send us your show idea. If we use your show idea, we will send you a T-shirt for your idea and look forward to hearing from all of you. As always, fly safe and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe.